Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Ease of Passion. And honestly speaking, I didn't think that I'll be making another video anytime soon up until the Olympics. But in the last week or so, a lot of major developments have taken place in the world of women's football. And judging by the thumbnail I've used, you can already tell that it's not all good. So without any further ramblings, let's get started off in Manchester. With courtesy from Bloomberg and Tom Gary who broke the news first, Manchester United, the sporting side at least, which means Ineos and Jim Radcliffe, have pretty much kicked his women's division to the curb. If you've been following the Ineos takeover of the sporting operations at Manchester United, it should not come as much of a surprise that this is happening, because in one of the very first interviews that he gave, Radcliffe stated that he hadn't even touched on the topic of the women's side and only further solidified his statement by later attending the men's Manchester United vs Arsenal game which the latter won instead of attending the women's FA Cup final in which Manchester United were victorious against Tottenham Hotspur. Actions speak louder than words, but dear old Jim here has gone and made himself the largest empty vessel in the entire room. And it's bad enough that so early in his reign at United, Radcliffe has shown such disregard for the women's team, but as I am about to go into now, we'll see that it's upgraded to disdain, if not even worse. Going back to Gary's report, and recently we found out that the women's side have been relegated to second class citizens as they have been kicked out of the recently constructed training facility that was specially made for them in order to make way for the men's first team. Now, the reason for this is because the men's training facility, aka Carrington, is said to be upgraded to the tune of 50 million pounds because as everybody knows, it's still stuck in Fergie time. And full disclosure, it's a really good thing to want to bring up your players' facilities to the best possible standards, especially when you consider that it's the men's first team that brings in the most eyes and thus the most money. But in this case, there is no excuse to have done it in this manner at the expense of your women's team. Whilst the men's side take advantage of the women's gym, the women themselves have been relegated to Porta facilities, as Gary calls them, which I just personally imagine to be something akin to a refurbished uh, shipping container, and to me, it just stinks of neglect. If you had to move the women's team away from their designated training area, which shouldn't be the case in the first place, mind you, then it, it would not have been hard to find uh, a local team in the area that can provide the adequate facilities that would still allow the women to train in the best possible conditions. The United Women's team are a team on the rise and year by year they have been improving. From winning promotion to the WSL at the first try, finishing in the top 3 recently and winning their second piece of major silverware in the FA Cup. Such progress needs to be rewarded and built upon to improve their chances of being able to consistently compete with the Arsenals and Chelsea's of the WSL. And if you thought that behind the scenes was bad, on the pitch it only gets worse because if you remember in the last video that I made, I touched on how female players are rarely ever tied down to long term contracts and are practically expendable to their clubs. And well, this too has come to pass at Manchester United with some key departures being on the horizon and some having already been announced, such as England legend Nikita Paris, Spanish national team regular Lucia Garcia, England number one Mary Earps, and shockingly enough, United's own club captain Katie Zillum, who has been there since day one. There's no need for me to insult your intelligence because it's evident that these are some major departures that Ineos has allowed under their watch and to see such big names all leave in one fell swoop makes you wonder what exactly is on the agenda when it comes to the women's team. Thankfully though, given the quality of these individuals, they will definitely land on their feet. With Garcia already signing for Rayados in Mexico and Herbs heavily touted to make a move to PSG, whilst Paris and Zelen will not be short of suitors whatsoever. Manchester United are undoubtedly a crisis club at this point in time, and only time itself will tell, once the dust settles at least, what lies ahead for the women's team. But right now, it all looks very foreboding and ominous. With all this negativity that we've covered so far, why don't we take a look on the brighter side of women's football? With some great news coming out of both Germany and Italy, as their respective top divisions have announced expansions to the teams participating from the 2025 to 2026 season onwards, with the Frauen Bundesliga going from 12 to 14 teams and Serie A Femenile going from 10 to 12 teams. This is of course awesome stuff to hear because it shows the ambition by the respective federations to continue growing their women's divisions and hopefully other leagues can take a cue from these two. But 
With just about any bit of good news, there comes some skepticism and concern such as finances, playing time, and administrative issues like registrations, licenses, and club facilities. With the introduction of the new teams into the top divisions, obviously the broadcasting revenue and other slices of the pie will be smaller in order to accommodate for everyone so that they each get an adequate cut amongst many other things of concern that I won't plagiarize in this video because the excellent as always she scores bangers has made a video about the Frauen Bundesliga's expansion which I have linked in the description below. In it, she goes into much greater detail about the pros and cons of expansion and all the points that she raises can be extended to the city of Feminio and she does explanations far greater justice than I can. So once you're done here on this video, you can check out her video to get a more in-depth explanation of these league expansions. But nevertheless, it is such fantastic news to hear. And finally, the evolution of women's football continues. Because back in England, it would appear that the summer of Kang has begun, with the owner of the London City Lioness is completing a quadruple coup of not only acquiring a new training facility for a team and as well as a new playing ground, but also announcing the signings of world-renowned player Kosofare Aslani and more shockingly, at least in my opinion, outgoing PSG manager Jocelyn Precher. A while back, I made a video on football's Iron Lady and how all signs point towards her being a force for positive growth in the women's game. And these recent moves are her putting her money where her mouth is, and this is surely only just the beginning of the movement that she's looking to implement. The signing of Prisha in particular is a massive signal of Kang's ambition to make her team a powerhouse in England. And given how far Prisha went with PSG domestically and in Europe, with the right backing and recruitment from his boss, which he is nailed on to receive in my opinion, it wouldn't be too much of a shock to see the Lioness gracing the WSL come 2025. And during this off period, they will definitely be one of the most interesting teams to keep an eye on because it's just the beginning of the summer of Kang. Don't be surprised if the likes of Zelem, Paris, Hell, even Midama end up wearing the famous blue of the Lionesses. And that will do it for today's video. Thank you all as ever for watching. What do you think of the things that I've discussed in this video? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel if you've liked what you've seen here for more content on women's football like this and more. And I will see you in the next one.